evolution, a deliberate yet subliminal process for all but humankind. We cannot wait. It's one small step for man, one giant leap for mankind. He's on the move. Hello and welcome. Coming up, archaeologists have found 11 mummies adorned in gold in Egypt's western desert. The find in the Valley of the Gold Mummies is one of the most complete ever uncovered and is expected to offer important new insights into ancient Egyptian history. In Japan, nervous mothers look on as their babies battle it out in a highly unusual and traditional sumo ritual that has been celebrated here for over 800 years. It was the butt of many jokes, and it certainly saw its fair share of mishaps. But the orbiting Mir station was one of the greatest achievements of the Russian-Soviet space program. But first, we drop in on Lord Montague of Bewley as he poses for a photo with his dogs and his Rolls Royce. Bewley has become known throughout the world as the home of Britain's finest collection of vintage cars. That's lovely. Scott, seeker. Scott. The backdrop is Lord Montague's family home. The Palace House, as it's known, was originally the gatehouse of the ancient Abbey of Bewley. It was sold for £1,300 to the Earl of Southampton in 1538 and passed directly to the present Lord of the Manor. The family lives in one of two wings added in 1870 by Lord Montague's grandfather. It's an eclectic architectural mix of 14th century Gothic and Victorian styles. The rest of the house is open to the public. Visitors also get to see how a Victorian kitchen operated. Lord Montague has always been adamant that visitors feel they're visiting a house and a home, not a museum. Today, the Bewley Band leads villagers to a reunion at the village school. Present students mingle with pupils past, many in their 70s. Lord Montague enjoys taking part. The Lord of the Manor has always had a special role to play in a village like this and feels quite responsible for the people who live on the estate and whose ancestors worked for his father and grandfather. Lord Montague's now world-famous motor car collection grew from this first car, a 1903 de Dion Bouton, acquired by his father John in 1913 in lieu of rent from a tenant. Lord Montague started the museum as a testament to his father's work, promoting motoring. John Montague campaigned and lobbied in the face of fierce opposition for acceptance of this newfangled invention. John Montague owned this 1899 Daimler, the oldest vehicle in the collection and the first four-cylinder car. It was the first car allowed into the House of Commons Yard and the first British car raced on the continent. John Cobb's Railton takes the record past the mother. This 1906 Columbia electric car belonging to Queen Alexandra, wife of King Edward VII, drove so quietly that one day she ran over an unsuspecting gardener on the Sandringham estate. Every vehicle in the collection of more than 300 has its own story from the early attempts to break land speed records to today's Formula One races. From the E-Type Jaguar to the Jaguar XJ220. 
This 1935 Auburn 851 was driven by Marlene Dietrich in the film Desire. And for those who like to mix cars with adventure, shaken not stirred of course, there's a special James Bond memorabilia section featuring some famous Bondmobiles. As the home of motoring in Britain, Bewley hosts a packed calendar of rally events throughout the year. June sees the annual Mini Cooper S convention, with over 900 Minis converging on the palace from all over the country. Enthusiasts celebrated 40 years since British Mini fan John Cooper souped up the first Mini, converting it into a racing car. It's a chance to find that elusive spare part and to consider restoration efforts. Each car is a labor of love. Peter Laidler noticed holes in the roof of the Mini he was restoring and discovered it was a former squad car with the Liverpool City Police. Only three of the original fleet of 24 remain today. The police helped Peter achieve the authentic look. Have you got it running? The appearance of the new Mini sparked fierce debate amongst purists, but fans of the movie The Italian Job were delighted to hear the latest model would get the Cooper racing treatment from John's son Mike. From the spirit of the new Mini to spirits of a different kind. Founded in 1204 by King John, Bewley Abbey was home to the Cistercian monks for 300 years before King Henry VIII threw them out. Locals say their ghosts still haunt the place. Bewley is supposedly one of the most haunted places in southern England, and people often see figures of ghosts and grey ladies although Lord Montague has never spotted a thing himself. Bewley was heavily taxed and debt-ridden after World War II. The decision to open the doors to the public was made in 1952, nearly 50 years later. Lord Montague believes it's paid off. With its future secure, Bewley now attracts over half a million visitors each year who come to be part of this historic place of lords, legends and landmarks. by their discoverers as the most magnificent and complete mummies uncovered in recent times, Egyptian authorities have revealed tombs containing 11 mummies near the Bahrain oasis, 215 miles southwest of Cairo. Due to the excellent condition of this find, archaeologists should be able to paint a far more comprehensive picture of our ancient forebears and the environment in which they once lived. The mummies are said to be about 1,800 years old. They belong to one family and are all in good condition. Tombs which extend deep underground contain the sarcophagi, more than 240 small sculptures and an amulet of pure gold representing a son of the pharaonic god Horus. Some of the mummies have plaster casts bearing paintings of the gods of the afterlife. One which has particularly caught the imagination of the experts is that of a three-year-old child lying next to the mummies of his father and mother. It has a mask with the drawing of a child who appears to be crying. The Antiquities Council said archaeologists also found the tombs of the parents of the mayor of Baria during the period of Pharaoh Amos II, who ruled from 570 to 526 BC. 
The state's chief archaeologist for the area said the find would reveal important information about their beliefs in the afterlife. He added that a sarcophagus of the mayor's father should also contain a mummy. He explained how the limestone sarcophagus of the mayor's wife was also found, and beside it were 222 small statuettes and amulets, which provide comfort for the deceased in the afterlife. In the past two years, dozens of treasures have been found in the Baharia area. It's believed that no less than 10,000 sarcophagi are buried in the Valley of the Gold Mummies. The Manchester Museum is one of the world's largest collections of Egyptian mummies and as part of their research they pioneered many non-invasive scientific tests. Mummy science and the work carried out within the museum has brought us closer to the world of the ancient Egyptians. It's also allowed us to get to know a few individuals as well as is possible to know a person who lived almost 2,000 years ago. This is Azru, a singer in the temple of the god Amun at Karnak. She died when she was about 60 years of age. Azru would have been of the upper classes and had a very nice lifestyle in ancient Egypt. According to scientists at the museum, she had osteoarthritis. If you look at the top joint of the second finger, you can see it's bent back. This would have been how she was in life just before she died. In June 1975, doctors carried out the first modern autopsy of an Egyptian mummy, known as Mummy 1770. It combined modern scientific knowledge with the latest developments in Egyptology in order to learn more about how Egyptians lived and died. The newly established discipline of paleopathology made a great leap forward. The medical forensic team recreated the rounded adolescent features of Mummy 1770, leaving the model's mouth slightly open, as a bone defect may have caused nasal congestion. But who was Mummy 1770? The evidence is vague. The quality of grave goods buried with her leads researchers to conclude that this mysterious young girl was someone of importance. Margaret Murray, the first keeper of Egyptology at the museum, performed an early mummy post-mortem. Her 1908 examination of the remains of two brothers brought together experts in anatomy, chemistry and textile studies. A hundred years on, and it may soon be even possible to fight today's infections by understanding the diseases of the ancients. The 67-year-old Emperor Akihito ascended to the throne in 1989 after the death of his father, Emperor Hirohito. Crown Prince Naruhito is due to follow. Reports recently emerged that the Crown Prince's wife, Crown Princess Masako, was pregnant with a possible heir after nearly eight years of marriage. But unless the baby is a boy, the child can't sit on the chrysanthemum throne. Japan could face a succession crisis, since no royal male has been born for more than three decades. The thought of a female on the throne is anathema to conservatives, who in pre-war days saw the emperor as divine. But according to professor of sociology Daisaburo Hajizumi, even the rules are changed. Japan won't see an empress on the throne for some time yet. Crown Prince Naruhito is next in line for the throne. However, Hashizumi believes that by the time a royal princess is ready to become empress, the people of Japan will accept her wholeheartedly. Princess Masako's possible pregnancy has whipped up a media frenzy once again. 
two years previously when she was first reported to be showing signs of pregnancy, massive media stakeouts were seen outside the palace gate. But the princess miscarried soon after. It's also hoped that the emergence of a female emperor will change things for women in general in Japan. And speaking of both Japanese traditions and infants, the heart of Tokyo was abuzz with baby talk recently as parents and their toddlers lined up to take part in an ancient custom dating back at least 800 years. Behind the Asakusa Temple in downtown Tokyo, a sumo ring or dojo was set up and the names of the contestants written out, just as in a normal sumo tournament. The crying sumo contest requires mothers to give their babies to wrestlers to be shaken, stirred and frightened out of their wits. The main rule of this historic crying game is simple. The first baby to squeal wins. In Japan, there's a saying that a crying baby grows up strong, which explains why there are so many of these crying sumo contests held throughout the nation. But squeamish mothers needn't worry. Another key rule is that in no way can the baby be hurt. Some rural contests have been known to pinch the children to make them cry, but not here in Tokyo. Unfortunately, not all babies disliked the treatment they received. Some giggled. Others fell asleep in the big flabby arms of the wrestlers, though most preferred the reassuring embrace of their mothers. This little lad was happy to oblige the traditionalists and bawled his eyes out to win the match. And this little girl's mother explained the secret to their success. Little Miss hates strangers holding her, apparently. An ideal advantage when it comes to this bizarre competition. And after a long day under the sun, it's the mums who are left to take the prize for bringing up such happy, well-adjusted, bawling babies. And in keeping with tradition, all the tiny contestants are paraded before the judges and the spectators one last time. Then the competition is ceremoniously brought to a close for another year. Russia's glorious space program began with the launch of the first satellite, Sputnik, on October the 4th, 1957, to mark the 40th anniversary of the October Socialist Revolution. The next step was the first manned flight on April the 12th, 1961, when Russian cosmonaut Yuri Gagarin blasted into orbit and flew around the world. Construction of the Mir space station was another scientific and technological achievement. The first module of the space station was launched into orbit on February the 20th, 1986. Less than a month later, the first crew, Leonid Kazim and Vladimir Solovyov, were making themselves at home. The designers of the space station had intended their creation to last from three to five years, but Mir's lifespan turned out to be four times as long. Mir made over 85,000 orbits around the Earth in the 15 years of its existence, while several international crews worked together inside.
On February the 24th, 1997, Mir had its first serious accident. A fire broke out when cosmonauts tried to change an air filter. Soon after, a two-man crew arrived at the space station to adapt it for tasks ranging from industrial production and scientific experiments to space tourism and advertising in orbit. The hope for the Mir space station came from the US. Some investors pledged to pay 20 million US dollars to continue the Mir program. A month later, a cargo spacecraft delivered fuel and supplies to restart the space laboratory. Experiments continued for a time, but all efforts to prolong Mir's life came to nothing. Equipment failures were becoming commonplace, and promised private investments failed to materialize. The replacement of the basic section alone would have cost 350 million US dollars and taken four years to complete. On November the 16th, 2000, with almost all Mir's modules out of order, Russian space authorities finally decided to dump the aging hulk into the Pacific Ocean. The irreversible processes had begun, despite the protests of the Russian people who could only watch and wait with heavy hearts, as the one-time symbol of their nation's glory would soon crash into the ocean. Even former space station cosmonaut Vladimir Titov, who flew aboard Mir twice, dismissed criticism that Mir had outlived its usefulness, hailing it as a very successful example of Russia's space program. According to Titov, the orbiter was a victim of the nation's economic woes and feared that the entire Russian space program would follow it into oblivion. Unfortunately, while his arguments were falling on deaf ears, the space station was also falling, one kilometer closer to Earth each day. Just two weeks later, the pride of Russia was gone. But the Mir space station had left its mark in history.